Well, your suffering is almost over. This is the last night. We have been uh, discussing the book of Hebrews, and in particular, we have been uh, noticing several items in regards to uh, the theme that there's got to be a better way. Uh, we see it doesn't take much uh, prompting to be able to see the difficulty that our society has every day. I mean, you don't have to look very far to be able to see how disjointed our families and our communities and our nation is. The problem is that if we know how to fix it, then we just don't have the will to fix it. But I'm not sure that there are a lot of people that have the knowledge on how to fix their lives. They don't have the knowledge on how to fix their families. They don't have the knowledge on how to fix their community or to fix the nation that we have or even the world that we live in. And so we have been discussing this idea of there's got to be a better way. Listen, you know how obvious it is when, when uh, uh, if you're constantly running into a brick wall I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to have somebody tell you uh, all of the damage that you are doing when you're running into that brick wall. The, the evidence is clear. And you may not know how to stop, but you know the damage that is being done by the brick wall. And so there's got to be a better way than the way that we are approaching things today. The ideal of every religion and every uh, church is a valid, acceptable church and a valid, acceptable religion in God's eyes. I mean, look where that is getting us. We do need to ask ourselves the question, where has that gotten us? You know, we live in a pretty tolerable and, and free, and I don't mean free as in the freedom that we have by, uh, the, by the creator of the universe as declared uh, in the Declaration of Independence. That's not the freedom that I speak of. But we live in a society that allows everything and accepts everything as on some kind of equal plane with one another. That every thought seems to be equal with one another and that we should somehow, that's the way the word toleration is utilized, we should tolerate everybody regardless of how immoral their actions or their thoughts really are. That doesn't seem to matter. But we should just allow it to take place and we should accept it as a viable explanation of why we are here and who we are. And I'm here and I'm saying that there's got to be a better way than that. Look where it has gotten us as far as a nation is concerned. There's got to be a better way. By the way, while we're discussing this, you know, I might just mention, you know, we started out Sunday morning with this. This is a hanky. This is what we started out with. And uh, it soon became apparent that this hanky was not going to be enough for the sermon. That, uh, uh, that I, 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 I'm a fat boy, okay, number one. And when fat boys work and they get, they get heated up, they have a tendency to sweat. And so this just didn't do the job of the sweat that was working uh, Sunday, and so uh, I brought my preacher's towel with me. You know, a good, a good long hand towel. That, uh, and by the way, this thing is starting to uh, reek just a little bit. But uh, I've not washed it, but I have uh, air dried it out each day so that it would be ready. Okay, but I'm not really sure that that is going to be sufficient enough. So I went and got a 
uh, a towel that may be appropriate for tonight. You know, so uh, somebody asked me how the sermon was going to be, and I said, you better be ready to suffer uh, a little bit more. But, uh, you know, that's what this word of exhortation is all about. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 22, this is where we began Sunday morning. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. This letter that the Apostle Paul or the writer of Hebrews has written to his friends, his brethren in Judea and Jerusalem and that area is a letter that by definition is designed to call them back to the Christian faith. That's what this word exhortation means. Uh, Parakalisa means to call to one side. And that's what Paul is doing here, not just to his side, but his side is the side of Jesus. And so he is calling his Christian brethren. They have gone astray. They have let the word of Christ slip from them, according to Hebrews chapter 2 and beginning in verse number 1. They were in danger of not believing the gospel message anymore. In chapter 3 and verse number 12, Paul tells those same brethren to take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And he gives us the answer, by the way, of how if I am in a downcline in regards to departing from the living God, if I find it that my life, I'm drifting away from God, away from the Christian faith, he tells me in this text how to get it back. How to solidify my life once again. And so he says in verse number 13, But exhort one another, build one another up daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What we need today in order to help our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ is that we need a daily dose of the Word of God. We need daily encouragement. We need daily fellowship. You know, oftentimes people ask me as a preacher, well, why is it, preacher, that we're not growing like they were in the book of Acts? I'll tell you one reason. They met daily. And by meeting daily, and by working daily, and by evangelizing daily, they were added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And so if you have daily encouragement and daily activity, then God is allowed to have a daily addition to the Lord's church. And so maybe one of the activities that we're going to have to focus our attention upon and even double our efforts is our labor in the kingdom of God. We labor about everything under the sun. We worry in that fact that we're not putting enough attention to this and to that when in fact it's probably our fellowship. It is probably our labor in the kingdom of God that lacks the least amount of time in our calendar and in our activity. And so he says that we ought to exhort one another daily. I want you to notice in chapter 5. In chapter 5 concerning these same individuals, here are individuals who were drifting away from the Word of God. They had doubted the Word of God. They had drifted into unbelief. And now because of that, they find themselves without the ability to teach any longer. This concerns me in the Lord's church quite often. How many times have you heard this statement made? Maybe it's even written in a bulletin. And it's announced Sunday morning, possibly a week before Bible classes are starting. 
I don't know if it's in this one or not. I haven't read it. But here's the announcement. We need a Bible class teacher for the fifth grade class that starts next week. In fact, that announcement may have been made for four weeks prior to that. Nobody has stepped up. Nobody has said, I'll take the class. Nobody has said anything in regards uh, to who is going to do that. But we have to, now we have to beg and we have to bribe people to go into our Bible classes to be teachers. If you want to go out and you want to teach people the gospel in a public setting, we have to beg people and we have to bribe people now oftentimes to get them to do that. Notice what Paul was facing in the first century in Hebrews chapter 5 and beginning in verse number 11. Speaking of Jesus, he says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Now how do you tell if a group of people are dull of hearing? He says, for when the time you ought to be teachers. In other words, if you have a time frame, here's God's time frame. If you have a time frame in which a person should have developed from being a Christian, a brand new uh, a convert, and he has developed time-wise, he should be a teacher. If they are not teaching, if it's not public and private teaching that is on their mind. Getting the gospel to as many people as they possibly can. Telling the gospel story, whether it be to our own brethren or to the lost in the world. Then he says, you have need that one teach you again of the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become as such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now I want you to notice here that here is an individual that is a babe in Christ because he has developed poor hearing. He is dull in his hearing of God's Word. He is there, but he is not absorbing the Word of God. Dull of hearing is someone who says, when the preacher is preaching, they say, you know what? Brother so-and-so, Brother Jones, really needed that message today. They don't absorb it by saying, you know, I really needed that sermon today. They deflect the sermon to somebody else. Or they might say, and this is true, but think about it from the vantage point of the child of God and the reception to His Word. Think about this. Oh, I wish a hundred people would have been here. I wish the community could have heard that sermon. Okay, that's fine and dandy, but what about me, <laughs> you see? Did I need to hear that sermon? Was I encouraged by that? Was I rebuked by that? Was I reproved by that? Was I corrected by that? Was I uplifted by that sermon? You see, here's an individual who is a babe in Christ because they don't have good ears on. But now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, there is another element to being and remaining a babe in Christ, and that is carnality. Paul says that he couldn't speak unto them as unto mature, but unto babes because they were carnal in their thinking. That is, they were thinking the way the world thought about things, not the way that Scripture reveals them. They were always concerning themselves with how the world perceives things and not the way God perceives things. And so there are at least two different ways in which I can remain a babe in Christ. But here in the book of Hebrews, if it is written down toward the end of the 60s A.D., here are individuals that should have been members of the church for at least some of them up to 30 years in Christ. Up to 30 years. Now, let me just ask you this question. You don't have to tell me out loud. I don't want to 
want you to uh, tell me uh, in that fashion. But think about this. How long have you been a member of the body of Christ? Now you think about that. How long does it take for me to mature enough to begin to spread the gospel message to somebody else? And so he says here that here are individuals who had let the Word of God drift away from them. It had slipped away from their hands. And they began to doubt the Word of God. They began to not believe what the Bible actually said. Well, did Jonah, was Jonah actually swallowed by a whale or a great fish? Did he really spend three days in the belly of that creature? Did God really create the earth, the universe, and all that is in, in six literal 24-hour days? Did the flood of Noah's day, was it actually universal, worldwide catastrophe? Did Jesus really do the miracles that the Bible speaks of? You see, here are individuals that begin to doubt the Word of God. Now, I use the doubts that we have today. Their doubts would have been, is Jesus really the Messiah? Is He really the one that we were waiting for? Is this the kingdom, the New Testament church? Is this the kingdom that is to consume all other kingdoms from Daniel 2 and verse 44? Is this the kingdom that Isaiah was looking unto when he said that all men would be drawn unto it? You see, they began to doubt whether or not this was the actual kingdom and whether or not Jesus was the actual king. Was he really resurrected on that third day? Did he arrive? Did he uh, ascend unto heaven? Was he coronated as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Did he establish his kingdom? And so they begin to doubt. And in that doubt, they lost their ability to teach the Word of God. And then you come down to Hebrews chapter 10, and beginning in verse number 26. Here you have individuals now that have begun to despise the Word of God. He says here, For if we sin, and that is the idea of going on to sin willfully. If we go on sinning willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But here's what waits. A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now notice, here's the real problem. Here's the real problem in going on and sinning willfully. If I am engaged in a sin, that I am continually, willfully engaging in, it means that I am despising the Word of Christ. Okay, listen to what he says. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now I want you to pay attention to this because my brethren oftentimes seem to read these passages wrong. Here's how normally we would read this. Well, under the old law, God was a hard God. Under the Old Testament, God was a strict God. But under the New Testament, we have grace and we have mercy. And so God is good. And so I can continue in my sin and God will allow me to go to heaven anyway. I'm still in the good graces of God and nobody should judge me in my activity of wickedness. But I want you to listen to what the writer says here. Of how much sore punishment... Suppose ye should be shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified an unholy thing, and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Did you see that? Under Moses' law, they died, they died, he says, without mercy, under two or three witnesses. There's 
their testimony and there's the evidence and they were put to death. But now under Christianity, we have mercy. So it's going to cost us more. You see, this is the principle to whom much is given. Much is required. You see, we seem to think that because we've been given all of the great promises, better promises, enacted up, or, or, or a better law enacted upon better promises and a better sacrifice, that we should have to do less. And the principle from divine revelation is that we have to do more. You see, we've been given more, so more is required. So here are individuals who, under the New Testament, continuing in willful sin, and here's how he describes them. They were individuals who were trodden, trotting underfoot the Son of God. It was as if here was Jesus being nailed to the cross, and they just stomped on Him, you see. Trodden underfoot the Son of God. Let's just walk all over His sacrifice. That's trotting underfoot. They had done despite or counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Not just a neutral thing, but now it's unholy. It should not be touched. It's something to be despised. It's kind of like going to Wendy's and getting you that hamburger. I'm not going to mention that word. I ain't mentioned it in two nights. Okay, it's just not. But listen, it'll run out of anybody. And listen, if it's oozing all over somebody's body and it's running out of them all over the place and you're sitting there in Wendy's, I mean, listen, that's that's sickening, right? Just about. I've had two or three people say, I ain't ever going back to Wendy's after that. You see, it had nothing to do with Wendy's. I could have mentioned Burger King or Perkins. It wouldn't have mattered, you see. The idea is that they are, as he says here, they've counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. It is something I don't want to see. It is something I don't want to hear about. It is something that I do not want to touch. But he also says that they have done despite unto the spirit of grace. You see, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of an angry God. And so here are individuals who were continuing to despise the Word of God. And then you come all the way down to chapter 12 and verse number 25. Now, here's an individual that began by letting the Word of God just slip out of their hands. They didn't pay attention to it. They didn't give it enough uh, enough attention. And so uh, it, it just sat there on the shelf. It didn't study itself. It didn't learn itself. And because of that, they didn't put it into application. And when they didn't put it into application, they began to doubt it and despise it. And then now you come down to the fact that they don't even want to hear it anymore. Don't come by and visit me. Don't bring the Word of God to me. Don't bring it to my door. I don't want to hear it anymore, you see. Here are individuals that are actually refusing. At one time, they had received even the spoiling of their goods in a joyful way. They were glad to suffer for Christianity. But now, they do not even want to hear about Jesus anymore. They don't want to hear about the gospel message anymore. And so it says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped, who refused, for if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Do you see what he says? To whom much is given, much is required. Under the Old Testament, when they didn't want to hear the Word of God at Mount Sinai and hear God's booming voice then, you see, they were punished. There were consequences from that. What do you suppose is going to be now when it's not Moses speaking? It's not about the Old Testament. It's not about the blood of bulls and goats. It's not about a kingdom that is a physical kingdom with physical borders and, and a king that is just an earthly king, but now they're refusing to hear the precious message of the king of kings. A spiritual kingdom is what we are talking about. You see, if you refuse that message, there is no salvation at all that could ever be delivered to you outside of that message. And here were individuals. And so he says, 
says in verse number 29 of chapter 25 or chapter 12, he says, For our God is a consuming God. That's not an Old Testament God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's not an Old Testament God that he's talking about. By the way, there really is no such thing as an Old Testament New Testament God. There is one God and one Father who is above all, in all, and through all. There is just one Old Testament, New Testament, eternity past, eternity forward. You understand even that's an incorrect terminology. But through eternity, there is but one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so to reject that, to reject that message of that King and that Kingdom is to reject the only avenue of salvation that there is. Now Paul is writing, or the author of Hebrews is writing a word of encouragement, right? So I want you to hear this word. Based upon these things that he's already outlined, in the midst of this, I just want to point out a couple of things that he tells us in the midst of all of this. Here is his encouragement to the saints of God. Chapter 4, verse number 11. He says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Without going too much into the context, you can read in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and you can get the context. But I want you to notice this. Here is the encouragement. Out of all of this, the Apostle Paul says, I want you to labor. You want to know how to strengthen yourself in a time of when people are departing from Christ. You want to learn how to strengthen a congregation. Then you get the congregation. You get yourself to engage in labor. Labor for the kingdom's sake. You see? Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. Christianity is not just a mental religion. It is a laboring religion. All of the labor of love that must be done. The taking care of the widows and the orphans. The taking care of the needy and the preaching of the gospel. All of are necessary items and we must engage in labor. Our hands should look like they have been laboring in the gospel. Our hearts and our minds should be exhausted with our labor in Christ. If you want to build yourself up, if you if you find that you are weak in Christianity, let me just encourage you to do this. Do this. Get involved in the work of the church. Let us labor, therefore, in order to enter into this rest. And by the way, let me just suggest to you what this word means. This word is utilized in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to turn over there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15. Same word. Now in the King James Bible, it says, Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The American Standard starts out, and some of your other translations starts out and says, be diligent. Diligent is the word there. That word study in the 16 to 1800s simply meant to put a lot of effort into it. But let me show you how, if I could, just maybe with an illustration, show you how this word was utilized in the first century. They love their uh, athletic games, just like America today. And you would have an individual who was running a race, and he would have a coach. Now, in, in Lindsay, I haven't done this in uh, San Angelo, but in Lindsay, one of our deacons was also the head track coach. And so I went down at the track meet every year to help him out. And uh, oftentimes, when it'd be one of those long races, he would be down there at the, at the last corner. And the kids would be coming around that last corner, and he would be, he would be barking at them, yelling at them, Don't give up now. Keep on going. Run strong. Run through it. Keep it up. You know, keep on keeping on. Don't slow down. Don't stop. That's how the coach would do it. You get into you get in a basketball game and you're down, and the coach gets in there at halftime. Generally speaking, a coach doesn't just say, "Well, boys, I think we're 
doing all right. We'll be all Now, you might have a coach like that. I don't know. I never had a coach like that. Uh, whenever we was down at a basketball, especially if he thought we weren't putting a lot of effort into it, he would come in there. Listen, uh, I don't know if you know that. You probably don't know him personally, but the head coach of the uh, of North Carolina uh, won a national title when he did. Uh, by the way, that doesn't have anything to do with this, but he had he had he developed cancer, and that cancer ended up killing him. And because of that, there's a thing called the V. Foundation, Jimmy Vivano, I believe is how you say his name. And, and uh, I heard a conversation of his, uh, I have it taped on my television, by the way, uh, that ESPN, it was the first ESPY Awards, and uh, he, he, uh, he inaugurated the V Foundation at that particular point. I, was, I, I taped his message when I heard it the second time. It's a powerful message, but, but he was recalling a story about the very first time that he coached, and I think it was a Division II basketball game, but he was moving into the college ranks. And uh, before he became the coach, he had just read, he had just read, oh, my, my brain left me now, he just read the, uh, the book by... Uh, uh, the coach for the Green Bay Packers, uh, Jim uh, Lombardi. He had just read his. And Lombardi, before the uh, first Super Bowl, had, had waited five minutes before the game started. Most coaches come in about 30 minutes ahead of time at least. And he had waited five minutes on purpose. And he told himself, he's going to wait five minutes, and then here's Lombardi, a smaller man in comparison to the football players, burst through the doors, and he says, okay, gentlemen, he says there's only three things that matter in life. God, family, and the Green Bay Packers. And he says, let's go get them. They went out there and won that first Super Bowl. So he said, here's Jim Vivano. He's starting out as a new coach. He says, man, that is great. He said, I'm going to use that. So here are the, he's about 20, maybe 24 years old at the time. His kids are 18 to 20 years old. Okay? So he's waiting about five minutes before the game starts. And he goes to slam, to, to, uh, slam the doors open. And he says the only problem was that the doors swing out. And so he said he about broke his wrist. Uh, but after he picked himself back up, opened the doors, he walked in there, and he said, he said, listen, gentlemen, there's only three things that matter in life. God, family, and the Green Bay Packers. And they were looking at him, what? Well, you know, that's how he started out. Listen, Jim Vivano had the energy level that he needed. He had the, and this is the word here, he had the spadazu to get it done. He wanted them to understand the, uh, the zealousness that it took to be a child of God, but he lacked one thing. He lacked knowledge. You see, zeal without knowledge is of little value in the kingdom of God, according to Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. But I will tell you this, if you go the opposite way of having no zeal with knowledge, it is of little value as well. What value is there if we have the knowledge that we have the what the Bible says, that we have we have the, the Messiah, and we have the message of the Messiah, we have the kingdom of the Messiah, and it's all right here. What good is it if we do not have zealousness and labor and activity and diligence in getting the word out? It does us no good. You know, I began to think that there are some of my brethren that have what I call an, an Eorian complex. Y'all know what an Eorian complex is? You can shake your head or uh, nod your head, either one, it doesn't matter. Y'all know what that is? Not familiar with that? Well, I bet you really are. You've seen Pooh Bear, right? You know that donkey on there, right? His name is Eeyore. And he's a, hello, Pooh. How are you? I love you, Pooh. You know, my wife doesn't appreciate my enthusiasm uh, in telling her that I love her if I say, yeah, I love you. You know, she says, you know, you haven't told me you love me today. Oh, I love you. 
Uh, you haven't kissed me today. Yeah, let me give you a little quick peck on the cheek and I'm out of here. You know, my wife don't appreciate that kind of thing. In fact, if she has to remind me and then I do it, I don't get points for that. By the way, gentlemen, you know, if you're married more than a year, you know that. Young gentlemen, if you're not married yet, y'all, y'all put that in the resources of your mind. You etch that upon the chalkboard of your mind. If your girlfriend has to tell you, if your wife, when you get there, has to tell you, you don't get points for that, okay? That's just the way it is. Now, you probably know that because you have a mama, right? And you know you don't get points with mom. If mama has to remind you, you don't get points, see? And so that's important. But but my wife doesn't appreciate it because he is... Yes, Mona, I love you. She don't appreciate that very much. She she expects a little passion, you see. Yes, I love you, sweetie. You know, that gets a whole lot more than, yes, well, you know, yes, I love you. You know, I, I get the feeling sometimes that in the Lord's church, we think that that's the way that we ought to worship. That that's the way that we ought to sing out. You know, by the way, what a wonderful job. Why did y'all wait till the last to have the best song leader up here? I don't know. Leland, Leland, no, uh, uh, you know, no disrespect there, but uh, uh, you got a lot of experience on this young man, and uh, he's pretty good. But uh, you know what? Can you imagine? Here, here we're trying to, to help train and encourage and strengthen a young man in his leadership in song leading. And can you? And by the way, y'all did not do this. Uh, but I have worshipped at congregations who do this. Yeah. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah, we love you. You know, that's the way. That's their whole worship service. They have no energy level in it. They don't sing out. You know, I read in my Bible, the Bible says in Micah chapter 6, verse 1, lift up your voice to the hills. Listen, we are worshiping the Lord God Almighty. I know He can hear us if we whisper. But He didn't say whisper. He said sing. He wants our energy level. He says labor. Spadazu. Put your entire effort into it. It's as if I'm coming down to the end of that race and I'm hearing my coach saying, don't give up, run to the end. And I'm at the end of the race, I'm putting everything into it. That's spadazu. And so he says, let us labor, therefore. Now that's in the Christian work that we are doing. We are to put our entire effort into it. And according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, right? We are also to put that energy into our Bible study. Be diligent. Spadazu. Put all of your effort. It ought to make you exhausted and tired from studying the Bible. You ought to be up late at night uh, and, and fall asleep on your Bible at times. There should be times when you wake up early in the morning and you've been tired for a long day, but you've got something burning in your heart and in your mind like Jeremiah, and you can't you can't get your sleep. You're you're you're, you're you've got unrest in your bones, and you just have to get up and open. was. I want to know what my responsibility is. You see, that's spadatsu. That's the word that he uses here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 11 when he says, let us labor therefore. Let us labor. You know, the Bible is a wonderful tool. And as a tool, It must be treated properly. In fact, any tool, regardless of how beneficial it is, can be used incorrectly. It can be used inappropriately. And it can be used mischievously. My my wife's father is a craftsman of wood. For years he has built some of the most and restored some of the most beautiful furniture in our house. But several years ago, running a table saw, he lost the tip of his finger down to the first knuckle. You see, here is an experienced man who for whatever reason either neglect just getting too familiar with a dangerous tool or at times 
a piece of wood can catch itself in the saw, especially the older ones, and can cause your hand to go into the saw, which it did on this case, and took his finger, at least the tip of it, right off. Here's a craftsman. But now listen, if you called for someone to do some serious work in your house, I mean, they were going to mess with your great-great-grandmother's china cabinet. They're going to do some work on that. I mean, it means a lot to you. It's been handed down for years. You have the story of your great-great-grandmother purchasing it. You have the story of how it came out in a covered wagon to this area. You have the story of how the house it was rescued from that caught on fire. You have all of that in your memories about this. And when the carpenter gets there, he doesn't know the difference between a hammer and a screwdriver. You're going to let him work on that piece of art? Absolutely not. If he says, well, listen, I forgot my tools. Do you happen to have, what is that thing called, uh, a hammer? Do you have one of those? You're going to let him work on that piece of art? That piece of history, that piece of emotional attachment that you have to family that is gone? Well, you know the answer to that. Absolutely not. Let me just ask you this question. If our soul is worth more than the entire world, and if we recognize the value that is invested in our lives, why would I want anybody to work on my soul that doesn't know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? That doesn't know the difference between the covenants? Why would I want anybody to teach me and for me to sit under their tutelage if they do not know the simple plan of salvation? Why would I want to sup at their spiritual table if they don't know that the kingdom of God has already arrived? If they can't understand Mark 9 and 1, if they can't understand Colossians 1 and 13, if they can't understand Revelation 1 and 5, if they can't understand the simple principles of the Bible, why would I want to say to them, teach me? See, we've got to learn how to handle the Word of God. And my friends, the denominational world has not learned how to handle it appropriately. We can't sit out at their table and learn from them. They don't know what the kingdom is all about. They don't know who the Messiah really is. They don't know His role and His function. They're still waiting on a kingdom. By the way, if you're still waiting on a kingdom, according to Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 or 11, 11 and 12, you're still waiting on a high priest. If we're still waiting on the kingdom, then we are still in our sins. If we're still waiting on the kingdom, here was the passage that Leland was talking about last night. If we're still waiting on a high priest, then we cannot fulfill this passage. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. That passage is tied in to verse number 14. Look at it. Saying then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. We need to understand the Bible. And that means i got to treat it like a tool so that I can carve out with the Word of God. I can allow that Word to so work in me so as to whittle away who I am so that I can learn, as Jesus said to His disciples in Luke 9 and 23, to deny myself, to take up my cross, and to follow Him daily. You know what taking up your cross means? And I sometimes wonder if we understand what that means. It doesn't mean just taking up a few burdens along the way. You see, a cross 
is designed as an instrument of death. That's what it's designed for. You didn't put anybody on a cross to give them a little spanking, you see. You didn't put anybody on a cross to just give them a heart to heart. You put somebody on a cross to kill them and to mercilessly, mercilessly take their life. It was an instrument of death and Jesus said that you and I must take up that instrument of death daily. Every day we must kill ourselves. We must deny who we are. It's not about finding who you are. It's about denying who you are. Deny yourself. Take up your instrument of death daily and follow after Him. You see? That's the only way that you and I are going to be able to come unto the throne of grace and mercy with boldness is on our knees after we have been crucified of self. So we need to get rid of all the selfishness. Pride is listed as one of the three great categories of sin. Eve was tempted with these three categories. Jesus was tempted with these three categories. And in John chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, you see. He says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You see, those are the three categories, and we will be tempted in all three of those areas. But pride is something that I must rid myself of daily. By the way, I would suggest this to you. If you can rid yourself of pride, you're halfway to ridding yourself of the other two. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Because you have already submitted yourself unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're already going to watch your eyes. You're already going to watch your lips. You're already going to watch where you are, your activities and your friends. And you're already going to be careful about how you work and how you influence people in this world. You're already going to be that because you have learned to utilize the Word of God as a tool, as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And so let me tonight, in the close of our series of lessons on the book of Hebrews, well, listen, there's about ten of these let us therefore statements in the book of Hebrews. I'm not going to get to all of them tonight. I didn't intend to get to all of them tonight. But there's this one that I wanted to leave with you. You be a worker in the kingdom of God. You labor. You put all of your effort, all of your energy that you can in being the kind of people that God would have you to be as the church and as an individual Christian. And as a result... There is a reason why that Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is. You know, you don't have to worry about, well, do I, how do I produce love in my life? How do I produce joy in my life? That's not, that's not the worry of the child of God. See, if we are living the way God told us to live, as a natural result... A peach tree, by its very nature, is designed to bring about peaches. I've never seen a peach tree produce bananas. And if we are Christians walking by the instruction of the Spirit, we will produce in our lives naturally love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of the fruit of the Spirit. And if these things be in us, and if they abound, 
then we shall above all people be a blessed people. And so let me leave you with the encouragement tonight to make sure that you are a worker in the kingdom of God. And if you are not, that tonight is the perfect opportunity for you to let your brethren know, for you to repent of your sins. By the way, in activity, the sins of omission will send a man's soul to an eternal damnation as quickly as the sins of commission. So don't omit what you know that you need to do. But perform and perform valiantly your Christian service. Work to be one of the mighty men of God that we looked at last night. And so if you're here tonight and you want to be a part of a kingdom, you want to be a part of a church that has decided years ago, but has decided in their hearts and minds and in their spirits, they have decided to do what Jesus wants them to do. That nothing was going to deter them. No obstacle would stand in their way. But they're going to do the right thing. They're going to do it the Jesus way. They're going to do it the Bible way. Whatever the Bible tells them to do, that's what they're going to do. If you want to be a part of a group of people like that, and you're not a New Testament Christian, I want to encourage you tonight to do something about it. I want to encourage you tonight to spadazu a little bit. Get a little energy in your soul and spirit about your eternal salvation. Wait, just think, why should I be knocking on your door? If you think about it, and if people truly realize how horrible hell was and how beautiful heaven was, they would be knocking down our door to hear the message of the gospel. Well, because they're not. If you're here tonight and you want to be a part of that kind of kingdom, then I want to encourage you to believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that He is the King of kings, that He is Lord over all, and that you would, by that faith, make that confession to those that are here tonight and repent of all of your past sins and then be buried in the watery grave of baptism. Give up self. I don't understand people's problem with baptism. I really don't. People say that it's an activity of men. And I deny that. You find me one single passage in all of the Bible where baptism is not a passive act. Do you realize that baptism is the only passive act in the plan of salvation? That I actively must believe that I actively must repent of my sins, that I actively must confess the name of Jesus with my lips, but then when it comes to baptism, I am to allow someone to bury me in water. I have to passively be a dead person at that particular time. It is the only passive act in the plan of salvation. I'm giving up my myself. I'm allowing some stranger, by the way, maybe a friend, but I'm allowing them to hold me underwater in a burial. That's a passive act. It can't be something that I have done that God owes me anything. It is simply a request to recapitulate the wonderful blessings of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you to do what the Bible says tonight with all of your heart. If you're a child of God and you're a member of this congregation and you've been putting half-hearted service into your family, into your life, into the church, into your Christian service, let me just encourage you this. Stop it. Do you realize that God would rather have you hot or cold than lukewarm? That God considers lukewarmness. Now listen, I talked about snot already. So it's okay for me to talk about upchucking, right? That's the word there. You 
you understand? That's what he's saying. He will spew them. It is so nauseating to God that God, if He drinks, and this is the illustration, if He drinks your lukewarmness, it is so nauseating to Him that it, you know, like this. That's how He feels about the inactivity of members of the Lord's church. So let me encourage you, stop it. Put your heart and soul into your service. And if there's any way that repentance or prayer or confession of sin can help you tonight, this congregation, your brethren, they stand ready.